Hello, I think we're live. Not entirely sure. Just checking a couple of things. Right, okay. I'm going to assume we are live. So, what I'm going to do tonight is try and image the Rosette Nebula using my equipment. Um, obviously, just taking some images of the nebula is going to be quite boring, so once we get going, I'll probably end the stream. But I'll go through some of the setup of what I've done in preparation and what I'm going to do on the live stream. Uh, but first of all, I'll go through the equipment I'm using tonight. This is my primary imaging setup, and I'll just go through each of the bits. So we have a Celestron CGX mount here, which is a um, popular mount with astrophotographers. It's quite a heavy duty mount, can take quite a high payload. Don't, I can't tell you the exact value. Um, there's lots of cables, so beginners, they look at this and will think this looks quite complicated. And uh, there is an aspect of, uh, of that, to be honest. But once you've got everything plugged together, you soon uh, work out how to operate such things. So I'll go through what each of these are. So the mount on top of this, we've got the telescope. This is a refractor. refractor. It's a Skywatcher Esprit 100. Um, quite a decent scope. It's got a focal length of 550 millimeters, and it's got a aperture of f 5.5 and a hundred mil aperture at the front. Down here we have a ZWO 071MC cooled camera. Uh, the cooled bit is the important bit. Uh, it means we can basically drop the sensor temperature right down to crazy figures minus 20, minus 30 below ambient, ambient temperature. And the reason we want to do that is, uh, just like any camera, the DSLR, your iPhone camera, there's a CMOS sensor, which actually is the, the bit that connects, sorry, that ca captures your light photons. And when you're taking long exposures, that sensor gets very hot. So if you can keep that cool, um, you get less noise in your picture. And when we're taking long exposures of the night sky, the, the less noise we have in the final result, the less we've got to process it out and the better overall image quality is. So whilst I used to use a DSLR, and that's absolutely fine as a beginner, um, as you progress, you'll find that the longer exposures, you'll get more noise and you'll start looking at cooled cameras. They are quite expensive. Um, ZGBO is quite a popular range. I would say it's, sort of, it's not low end and it's certainly not high end. It's sort of in the middle somewhere. And then up here we have a guide scope. This scope is used to track and provide corrections to the mount. So once the mount's going, it's basically rotating in the opposite direction to the Earth's uh, rotation. Now, because that's all done with mechanics and gears and worm wheels, there is often errors introduced. So what this guide camera and guide scope do, and this is a little guide camera in the end, is they basically lock onto a star and they look at its movement and they say oh that shouldn't be moving that way so they send very very minor corrections to the mount to try and adjust it to keep everything going and that's technically called guiding on top of here we have an intel nook that's just basically a windows 10 pc this is what i'm actually doing the live stream on right now so this is a windows 10 pc with all my astro tools and bits of software installed and then finally down here we have what is called a power box. This is providing the power to the nook, the cameras, the mount. Behind there is a focuser which you can't see. Um, as with DSLR and lenses, there's no concept of autofocus on a uh, telescope on one of these. So um, you can be very brutal to yourself and try and adjust the fine focus wheels and again that's fine but I've elected for an electronic focuser which you can't see but it's behind uh, the other side of the scope. All that's connected to this power box and it basically means that I've got one cable which is this little cable down here is leading the mount to the power. So all these cables all rotate so you don't get any cable snags. Again as a starting up in astrophotography that's one of the things that you'll find is cable management soon becomes uh, High on your priorities so let's crack on okay over here this is the software for that power box i've just been referring to and 
very important figures which is telling you on here is the outside temperature. Um, that's what we've been doing for the last half hour or so, well, a couple of hours actually. And this is the dew point. Uh, and why are we interested in that? Well, what happens when the temperature drops to the dew point or below is just like when you get out and look at your car in the morning and it's covered in uh, water, condensation, that's what will happen to the lenses on the telescopes, both the guide scope and the main scope. Uh, we want to stop that from happening. So just let me bring back up my picture because I didn't get to mention that. These two black bands here are basically dew heaters. So they've just got a little bit of wire inside some uh, material that you wrap around and they get just basically warm. So they keep the end of the scope warm, which stops dew forming on the lens, which is inside this tube and they're attached to the power box. This software will let me basically, uh, if I wanted to, I've got them on full power at the moment because I've got a feeling one of them's not working on the guide scope. I'm going to turn on auto tube, which basically means um, it will adjust the power to those bands based on what it thinks the dew level currently, or when the dew is going to kick in. At the moment, it thinks that it's a minus two. So at, at minus two tonight, we should start seeing dew starting to form outside. Um, and this thing will just start adjusting. The rest of it is basically um, the power consumption that's going through the, the box. Okay, let's have a look at some stuff. So, what we're going to image tonight is the Rosette Nebula. What does that look like? Oop. So, this is what it looks like. It's a very uh, impressive thing in the night sky, it's just to the east of Orion. Um, it's what is called an emission nebula, uh, which means it's uh, made up of lots of different types of gases that uh, your normal uh, camera and lens won't see. So um, I'm actually using a filter called a narrowband filter, which is doing two things tonight. One, it's allowing me to capture all this lovely data, and two, it's going to be helping with the uh, moon that's quite prevalent in the night sky at the moment. So it should stop a lot of that moonlight affecting it. If I was trying to do this with a normal lens, I, I wouldn't be able to basically. So now we know what we're looking at, let's have a look at the tools I'm going to be using. So we have, where's my PhD gone? There it is. We're going to use PhD2, which is a very popular piece of software for the guiding. So for the guiding camera and the scope at the top Thing. This is what's going to control this. I'm going to be using Astrophotography Tool version 3.84. Again, another very piece, a popular piece of software to allow you to capture your images. It does all sorts of other things as well. And I'm also going to bob in and out of Stellarium, which is a planetarium piece of software. Um, this is connected to my mount as well. So this is basically, that's where it, it thinks my telescope is currently pointing. Um, and I, I can use it to basically quickly find targets in the night sky and tell my scope to go there. So let's just minimize that for the moment. Um, go to my camera tab over here. Um, I mentioned earlier about cooling the camera. So um, I've already cooled it. There's a function in APT called Cooling Aid. Um, what you do is you set the temperature you want it to do. Uh, I've set it to minus 10. And then this is the important bit. You set the step size of how quickly you want it to drop. If you were to just drop that camera to minus 10 and you said, get on with it, you'd almost certainly end up with condensation probably start forming on the actual internal window of the camera. Um, so what this does is it allows it to cool it down over a period of time. I think it took about 10 minutes um, for it to get down from about, I think it started at about one degrees uh, and it will keep it at minus 10 now. Um, and you'll notice there's a warming aid. So at the end of the night, I have to warm the camera back up. Otherwise, if I just switch it off, 
uh, and bring it inside. It's a bit like um, when you open your fridge um, to the warm air, you'll get lots of condensation happening inside the camera chamber, which I don't want to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the Rosette Nebula in Stellarium. Here it is, and you can see there's the moon up there. It's fairly close, but we should be okay. Um, I haven't tested this yet. I've just made sure of a couple of things before we started, um, which I'll go through in a minute. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to slew the scope to the Rosette Nebula. Now, I normally go and look outside because I hate the... F I'm not, I don't trust my setup yet. Um, if cables get snagged, bad things will happen. But I'm fairly happy we should be okay from the tests I did before we went live. So what should be happening now is, if I've got everything right, yeah, is my scope should start to come over very soon. I know that it's doing something because IPT says it's slewing. But I'm not seeing it in here for some reason. Let's try that again. Okay, I think we're there. It's not what I was expecting to see though. What we're gonna do is I'm just gonna take oh no. I was gonna take I'm gonna take a very quick uh shot but at four hundred seconds. That's not a very quick shot. So what I'm gonna do is change my exposure to fifteen seconds and just hit shoot. Okay, so you might go, oh, how can you tell that's a Rosette Nebula? Well, I can't. I think I'm pointing it in the right place. So what I'm going to do is something called plate solving. So what plate solving will do is it will look at this image, work out what it is, and then I'm going to send it to Stellarium to say, show me what I'm actually looking at. So just to make sure that I'm going to be looking at, I'm just going to move my cursor completely away from where I think I am. Plate solving in APT has got point craft. I'm going to tell it what my scope position is. It's got that from these coordinates up here. And I'm going to press solve. You can see that it says it's solving. So hopefully, in a few seconds, it says success. I'm now going to tell it to show me what it's looking at. And when I press show here, what's going to happen is it's going to show me in. Uh, yeah, we're completely off. It's going to show me in Stellarium what we're looking at. So let me just double check that that's what that was doing. Oh no, there we go, it's just me. So I'm fairly happy that's actually uh, ooh, fairly bang on. Would I want it a little bit more centered? Probably, but for the purposes of what we're doing tonight, I'm happy with that. Now, obviously, you can't see anything in here yet of the nebula, and that's because I've only taken a 15 second exposure. So let's delve into guiding. Guiding is probably one of the most frustrating and also rewarding parts that I'll be. Without guiding, um, I probably wouldn't be able to take the 400 second exposures that I'm planning on taking. Um, that's just due to the mechanical limits of the uh, mount that I'm using, even though it's a, a decent one. Um, there are just too many 
uh, things that will go wrong in that 400 seconds and even the slightest movement away from the stars that we're looking at will result in elongated or egg-shaped stars. So guiding should help with this. Um, I'm not using the new beta version of PhD2 which has multi-star guiding which does look very interesting. Um, I'll certainly take a look at that when it goes into release. And so in PhD2 I'm just going to connect my equipment and then what we're going to start doing is looping the exposures of two and a half seconds on the guide camera. So if you remember uh, back on my image, this is actually this camera here. So PhD2 is connected to this camera and um, it's looping what it can see. And what we do in uh, PhD2 next is I've, I've pre calibrated this, but um, we get it to choose a star. And it will pick what it thinks is the best star in the current field of view. So it's picked this one. And when I press this uh, target button, what it's going to start doing is basically following that star. And so even though the mount's tracking the night sky, it's not actually looking at it from the mount. It's just moving in the same orientation as the Earth. This is actually looking at a star and saying, right, you shouldn't be moving very much. And if it moves, it'll start adjusting and sending corrections to the mount. You can already see um, I'm gone over one arc minute of corrections, which... Uh, a lot of people say you should try and keep this below one. I have a theory of if your stars are round in the edges of your picture and in the middle of your picture, don't worry too much about this number. There's lots of different things that can affect it. Some days, some nights, I have this number down at 0.7, which is great. Some nights I have it at 1.2, 1.3. Um, I'm going to take a test exposure. And we'll see how we get on with this. And what you'll also find is, just because I've just started up now, is this will end up settling down to potentially down below about one. Um, so don't chase your numbers too much. If this is up at six and sevens, yeah, you don't, you've got problems. But between one, one and two, just um, keep an eye on the sharpness of your stars. Now it is creeping up a little bit, which is uh, not ideal. So, before I actually start a plan off, what I'm going to do is I'm going to close these out of the way. And this is going to be dead boring now, unfortunately. I'm going to put in uh, a 400 second exposure and I'm going to hit shoot. APT is up here, it's counting away. Nothing will happen until that's finished. We'll go back to guiding. It's dropped a little bit, 1.27. It's not too bad. This was, does look slightly out of focus. I did pre-focus it in the day. Um, and there is actually a, a, a view that PhD works better with slightly out of focus stars, but this, this peak here doesn't look too bad. You normally look for like a flat topped one. Looks okay. It is dropping now, 1.25. I think we'll be okay. Um, so a couple of things that I did before the live stream and I couldn't really show you this because I have to be outside to do it. So I'm currently sat inside. Uh, I'm remote desktoping to that nook that was on the picture. One of the things that you have to do for astrophotography is called polar alignment. And what this is doing is aligning your mount Go back to that picture, which I keep closing. It's aligning your mount to the North Celestial Pole. And whilst there's no exact star on the North Celestial Pole, it's a point in the night sky, but there's a star very close to it called Polaris. If we have a look in here, um, Polaris is very close to the North Celestial Pole, and what I use is a uh, a device called a Polemaster, and it's another camera which you can't see fitted on here. And 
um, what a pole master does is basically very, it took me about five minutes to polar align tonight. Very quickly lets me polar align my scope. Without polar alignment, um, you're just basically going to get some very uh, elongated stars or just lines in the sky. Um, so you can't just point your mount at any place and off you go. Uh, used to frustrate the hell out of me till I got a pole master, and there are still some people who will look through a polar scope. My CGX mount doesn't have a polar scope. Uh, it's, it wasn't designed to have one, but a lot of Skywatch mounts do. And there's nothing wrong with doing it the old fashioned way. Uh, you get used to the electronic way or the old fashioned way. As long as you get polar aligned um, to Polaris, and there's lots of different techniques, uh, you're all good. There is another way you can do it using a program called SharpCap, which uh, does a bit of plate solving. Um, it's only £10, and you can use your guide cam to do that. A bit cheaper than using a pole master, which includes buying a camera. So if you've already got a guide camera, uh, you certainly can use pole, uh, sharp cap, which uh, some people say is even more accurate than pole master. I've tried both. Uh, I did some experiments a while ago where I polar aligned using pole master, then I did it with sharp cap, and they were basically bang on, then did it vice versa. So whether I got lucky or not, I don't know. But The other thing I did um, before we started was we did star alignment. So again, this is two techniques. Uh, two pr procedures that you do that some people, um, especially beginners, might get confused with. There's polar alignment, just described, and then the star alignment. So what star alignment is, when you've got your mount and your telescope pointing in the night sky, it really doesn't know what it's looking at. And what star alignment lets you do is you can basically navigate to a well-known star, say, take a picture and then see how far off from the center that star is. Now, there's a lot of bright stars in the night sky that stand out from the others. And those are often used because they're very easy to distinguish because they're just, they're just like a blowing, they're blowing, a glowing ball of white light in the middle of the screen or just off to the middle or wherever. If your alignment's really out, you won't see any, but um, usually. So what you do is you do an alignment where you get the center of the star that you've uh, slewed to in the middle of the screen, and you go to two, the next star. So I'd normally do a two or three star alignment, and what it basically means is when you navigate to your final destination, you're, you're hopefully it's fairly in the middle of the, uh, the field of view that you're shooting. You can actually just do, if you do using plate solving, which I did earlier, you can actually do away with alignment, but old habits die hard and all that. Um, so, I'm not going to go back to that now. Let's close these windows. Please tell me I just didn't close APT. Phew. So I've got about half a minute, fingers crossed, this isn't a really bad, please don't be a really bad image, <laughs> otherwise I'm going to look the right idiot. Hopefully we should see something of the Reset Nebula, if I'm pointing in the right place. And then before I start shooting, um, I'll go through some autofocusing, uh, which I've pre-done before we went live, because uh, autofocusing can be, um, it's not always straightforward, um, depending on what type of focus you're using. Let's have a look, 30 seconds. Any questions in the chat? Oh, Mr. Clarkey, Jez Rugen. He's doing his first ever capture of the Horsehead Nebula. That's a nice target. I've only ever captured that. Twice, I believe, one in the wild field, wild, wild, wide field shot, and the other um, as part of the classic Orion Nebula, which is present in our night sky. Here it comes. Let's have a look. Okay, that doesn't look too bad. Now, if you were expecting to see NASA type images, you're not going to get that. As with a lot of astrophotography, 
It's all about capturing the light over multiple frames. So this is one frame, and, and I can tell there's an awful lot of data there too. So to a beginner, they might go, oh, looks quite rubbish. And yes, it, it, if you were just using that as a one shot, it would be quite rubbish. But I'm hoping to get about six hours of exposures in tonight. And what we do with those exposures is we stack them together. And when you stack them together in some uh, special software, that allows it to drop this signal to noise ratio right down so you get all this lovely data coming out. And you do have to do some other processing. You're not altering the image, you're just manipulating it to show the right data. Um, what I normally do at this point is, uh, I normally have a quick look to see how round the stars are because that's a good point for if the guiding's okay. And then they're actually quite good. And it actually looks to be in focus as well. So before I start the plan and end the stream, I'll just go through focusing. If there's any experienced astrophotographers in here, they're going to be going, what's he doing? It's going into Sequence Generator Pro. So Sequence Generator Pro and APT are basically tools that do the same thing. I've used APT for two or three years now, and I'm not ready to move to Sequence Generator Pro. However, Sequence Generator Pro has a fantastic um, autofocus routine in. So I'm actually going to use that just to do the autofocusing. At some point, I probably will move to, to Sequence Generator Pro for my main uh, session, but tonight I'm just going to use it for focusing. So I'm just going to connect my equipment in here. Uh, we only need the camera. And the focuser connected. Come on, please connect. It's taking a while. Let's just check over here. Yeah, it's connected in APT. Hmm. Let me disconnect in here. Normally with ASCOM connected equipment, you can connect multiple programs to the same device. But yeah, didn't seem to like it for the focuser. Now it has, I can tell the, this over here, the focus position has changed. That temperature will adjust itself in a second. Uh, so I'm just gonna take a quick 15 second image in SGP and make sure the camera's working okay. I'm connected to the same camera that APT is connected to, and that's one of the great things of ASCOM. Watch my other videos on uh, learning ASCOM. Let's do a little bit of a stretch. Yeah, so this is what we're seeing in Sequence Generator Pro. So I'm okay. So I'm going to pan me. I pre-configured my autofocus settings, so again, these I just got out of the stop manual. 15 seconds, bin in 2x2, two two, 9 points, and step size 455. I'm actually going to adjust that just for tonight to 250, because I did some experimenting earlier, and 455 didn't work very well. I'm just going to make a note of the current focus position, because if this goes horribly, horribly wrong, I can just go back to that, because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the focus I've currently got. So what this is going to do is it's kind of going to move the, the focuser out of focus from where it is. So when you do an out of focus routine, you have to be fairly in focus to start with. You don't have to be spot on, but you've got to be somewhere fairly close, close, close ish. Can't speak. And what Sequence Generator Pro is now doing is it's moved the focus tube out, and you can see in the background this is now clearly out of focus. And what it's doing is it's drawing the focus tube back in and taking another picture. And what we're looking for in this graph is a U or a, a V curve, it's a hyperbolic curve. So somewhere down here, hopefully, it'll be in focus and then it'll actually shift it back out of focus again. And from that, from the averages and maths that are far beyond me, um, it'll be able to work out what the best position is for focus. 
again, this can take two or three, maybe four or five minutes to complete, but there's nothing worse than setting off an imaging session and you're out of focus because you can't correct that in post-processing. They're out of focus, they're out of focus, there will be blur, blurry messes. And I've taken my fair share of night imaging sessions where I've been slightly out of focus. It's just heart-wrenching to see that you've just wasted potentially three or four, maybe even more hours of time. So you can see there, this this number here, the HFR, the half the flux radius, the smaller that number, and the smaller the dot, the star, then the more in focus it is. So it's getting closer and closer to focus. It's gone even further, and it's, it thinks it's got halfway through now. Don't worry about the red line. The red line doesn't mean a bad thing at the moment. It actually got down to 68.140, which is the position on the focuser. HFR average of 1.1 is incredibly low for this scale and thinks the quality of that overall is about 99%. So it should start moving the focuser back out of focus now, and going upwards. So HFR, larger number, more out of focus, lower number, more in focus. It currently thinks that this position is the best at the moment, and it's taking more 15 second images, analyzing them, Seventy seven percent complete, and this is what you're looking for in your autofocusing routine in SGP is a nice V or a U curve. I'm going to shut up for a while. Got five people watching. Wow. I thought there was only going to be one, which would be Clarky. It's my first ever live stream. So, uh, <laughs> probably stumbled across my words. I just did it then. Stumbled across. What does that even mean? Stumbled my words quite a bit. So, it's finished now and it says it's taken a validation. Uh, validation exposure and then what it's basically doing now is it moves the focuser to this position because it thinks that that was the best position overall from this hyperbolic curve and I'm fairly happy with that so I'm going to come out of sequence generator pro because I don't use this for my imaging session which I could but I'm not ready to move to it yet And then back in APT, what I'm going to do is create what is called a plan. So a plan is just a number of exposures that you want to take and you can put things in there such as, um, I'll, I'll reuse, in fact I won't reuse one. You, test is probably not the best name. Uh, You can put in things like pauses. Um, so over here we want to say we're going to take 400 exposures. The binning level is one. Uh, I'll leave a pause and then the count is how many to do. So down here it's telling us how long we think this will take. Um, so I'm going to put in 60 for the moment. So I update current. So, total duration is 406 minutes. I'm going to press OK. When we start the plan, what we'll see is it'll tell me the estimated time it will finish. And I can work out if I want to extend it. How are we doing with guiding? Guiding, we're on 1.24. OK, 1.23, that's not too bad. I was happy with the test image. Uh, 400 seconds, we've got reasonably round stars. We can see there is that. Not exactly in the center. Do I want to center that? Um, no, I'll leave it as I can, I can easily crop around that area. I 
think it'll be absolutely fine. I'm just thinking if there's anything I need to worry about before I set this off. So just one, one more tip for beginners. I'm going to be keeping an eye on my or the temperature outside. And before I do that, let me connect this focuser back up in here. Even though I'm not using it in here, it will show me the temperature. It does this silly thing where it shows 100 degrees. It's obviously not 100 degrees outside. It will adjust accordingly. Um, I've never done this myself yet, and I'm going to do it tonight. If the temperature drops or increases by one degree from when I start, I'm going to refocus. I might set my threshold at two degrees, so if it's just by two, because if we're at minus whatever we are now, I've got a quick look. We're at zero. So if we drop to minus one or minus two, I will refocus. And the reason we do that is the temperature of the air around and in the night sky can affect the focus of the star. So this focus we got today, if I go and set up tomorrow night and it's three degrees, it won't be in focus. I guarantee it will be slightly different and again. So uh, it's quite common to refocus um, when temperatures change. So, okay, this focus, this value up here is the, um, again, I've got different values. This is the focus of temperature. So it's got its own thermal probe and it thinks it's minus 1.6 already. So as long as I use whichever one I'm using and whatever drops, uh, I think I'll use the this one, this minus 1.6. So if that goes off to minus three, minus 3.6, I will refocus. So I'm going to hit start. APT asks me for a name. And the reason it's asking me for a name is when it starts saving these files, these names will be in the files, along with some other good stuff. And off it goes. So it thinks it's going to finish at 3.24 in the morning. I'm probably going to abandon it. Abandon? Stop imaging at about 2-ish, I think, 2 a.m. Assuming we don't get any clouds, but it's looking fairly good for tonight. Um, well, I'll just keep an eye on things, and the main thing I'll be looking at is my guide graph, and also doing some uh, sandwich checking of the images as they come in. I always like to keep an eye on things, so I'll just let me find where we're going today. What date is it? It's the 23rd. Here's some images I took earlier, and there's the last one. So that about wraps it up guys. Um, it's pointless you watching this for the next four hours because nothing is going to happen other than images are going to start appearing here. Uh, so hopefully the sick people watching found something useful. Uh, I'll hang around for another five minutes if you want to ask any questions. I might just go outside and check the rig, make sure there's no cable snags. Um, Oh, there is, there is actually one thing. Um, I've accidentally toggled these silly constellation art tools. Installarium, which isn't showing very well. These, these lines here. One is the galactic equator and one is the meridian. Now, what's going to happen is when my scope goes past the meridian, it won't be able to track any further because if we're so far down, then my CGX has actually got some uh, safety limits and it will, it will stop it from hitting the legs. Um, but some scopes don't and you could basically carry on um, and just crash into the, the legs, especially when you've got long things stuck out your scope again, such as your camera and extension tubes and God knows what. So what happens is um, I calculated that uh, the Rosette Nebula that we're imaging is going to be approaching the meridian at about half past 10. So at half past 10, 
I'm going to have to do what is called a meridian flip. And what that basically means is it'll stop imaging and it will flip the scope to the other side and re restart the imaging. It's, you can make it all automatic, but as with everything that's automatic, sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it does. Sometimes there's part of me just say, I'll just stop it and do it myself. But tonight I'm going to try a automatic meridian flip in APT. And um, what you'll see in, in, in APT, if I don't know why this quality has gone bad, is there is a thing called session craft. And what this will do is when, when I turn it on, it knows when I'm approaching the meridian, it will uh, do the flip for me. Scary stuff, but uh, some people start imaging, then go to bed and wake up when it's finished. So um, I don't generally do that. So what I'll do is I'll just monitor it and see how we get on with it. And I might even do it myself manually. Right, I'm going to end the stream. Thank you all for watching. Sorry, it's been a bit shit in terms of my presentation. It's my first ever live stream. Um, and if you've learned anything, I'll take something away from that. Okay, thanks guys. And what, oh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll post the, the results of the uh, capture over the next couple of days. Uh, I don't normally process things for a couple of days after I've taken them. Um, don't know why, just never have. Um, it, it's certainly not a, a 10 minute job to stack them all and get them all done. So. This is quite a bit of time, almost as much time as in taking the images to process them sometimes. But I'll uh, certainly let you see what the uh, the outcome of this is. Okay, catch you all later. Hope you enjoyed it. Bye bye.